Now, our final faculty speaker for the evening is from the College of Arts and Sciences. She's a strong, brave, and brilliant woman, and these attributes are severely important in tackling the ignorance that is present in today's world. As a person, she's flamboyant, inspirational, and full of light. To all the people who are attending today's event, we present to you Dr. Janice Lusk. Hi, everyone. Um, just want to check, everyone can see my slides and everything, right? You just see a black and white screen right now? Yeah? Okay, good. All right, so um, I am going to be talking to you about the globalization of anti-Blackness and oppression of Black and brown bodies. Uh, and I want to get started by looking at three tenets for this discussion on global racism. First, I wanna make sure that we're dehistoricizing race. Race is not a phenomenon of the past, contrary to popular opinion. We are not post-racial, um, not in the United States, not in Europe, not in any global, regional, or local measure whatsoever. Um, and next, I wanna note that racism is apparent in just about any effort to create an us versus them dichotomy between cultural, ethnic, or racial categories. Um, I love this quote by ta Coates, um, the writer of Between the World and Me. Uh, but race is the child of racism, not the father. And third, race and therefore racism and uh, anti-blackness is a social construction. It's constructed by the language that we use, who is a migrant versus who is an expat. It's constructed by ethnicity, how geopolitical boundaries and national identity are defined and how race is confounded with ethnicity. And it's constructed by ideology. Uh, the othering that we see uh, xenophobia and dehumanization of outsiders. Um, all of these things help to construct the concept and the, the, the phenomena that is race and racism. Um, so therefore race, racism and anti-blackness are a global phenomenon. Um, contrary to popular belief, once again, um, these are not only American or Western phenomenons. They're typically found in any community uh, that intentionally or unintentionally categorizes people based on phenotype. Um, however, what we can see a variation of is the construction of race and racism, um, the consequences of these things like privilege, prejudice, discrimination, and violence, and how much they vary and, and with what intensity. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, a sociologist, uh, talks about the color line, which is like the separation um, in society systemically uh, and on a, mag sorry, on a micro level as well, um, based on race. And I want to push that color line beyond just the United States, which is where, you know, its roots are, and say that that color line is visible beyond the U.S. and beyond the West and the North. Um, and that this is true for all non-white people around the world. Um, however, today, because Black Lives Matter, oh, wrong side, <laughs> because Black Lives Matter, um, we're focusing on the duality of the visibility and in invisibility of Black bodies and their oppression specifically. All right, so I know what you're thinking, but we love Black people around the world. Everyone loves Black culture, right? Well, yeah, that's kind of true, right? Um, it's hard to imagine that the world has a specific issue with black bodies in particular, because as Henry Giraud states, black culture is mined for its exotic commodities worldwide. Um, we see black intellectuals that are making rounds on morning shows and podcasts around the world. We see black athletes, black musicians, uh, black comedians that everyone's laughing at, uh, black personalities, on every show, on Instagram, um, on RuPaul's Drag Race, right? Um, and then of course there's, you know, the entities that go beyond uh, celebrity, which are Beyonce, Idris, and the Pito Nyong'o, right? Um, but despite this shallow admiration, oops, sorry, despite the shallow admiration, somehow black bodies haven't been able to assimilate into the global society. And there's a deep legacy of hate expressed in a myriad ways. Um, so looking at some of the origins of anti-Black sentiment, um, we're not gonna ignore the fact that racism and colorism can manifest and emerge without outside influence. Um, but the origins of today's global racism is often tied to anti-Black sentiment in the global North, 
with roots in the transatlantic slave trade, despite the fact that exploitation of black bodies is universal. Racism and globalization appear with familiar bedfellows, and those are neoliberalism and neocolonialism. Uh, and, an, and an analysis of Zygmunt Bowman, uh, Henry Giraud points out that with the elimination of public space through neoliberalism, um, we lose investment in public good. And as he says, creating conditions for the suspicion against others, the intolerance of difference, the resentment of strangers, and the demands to separate and banish them and gain a paranoid uh, concern with law and order. And that should probably sound like some really familiar rhetoric right now. Uh, with neocolonialism and modernization paradigms, uh, they make no attempt to obscure their racism. Racism is made clear in the practices of exploitation, discrimination, and many forms of human and environmental degradation as well. Um, so I've talked about my research before a bit. Uh, I, I study this phenomenon called Blacksit. And it's really just looking at um, Black people uh, in, in one wave, it's looking at Black people from the US and the push and pull factors that make them migrate. The other wave is looking at global Black migration um, and push and pull factors and how much race counts in these factors. Um, and we, we see that uh, the oppression of Black people um, has a lot to do with their dia, dia, sorry, diasporic uh, experience um, in their home nations and abroad. And migration studies actually are one of the ways that we can look at uh, this international color line and how it affects um, individuals and their choices. So in research about global anti-Blackness, um, Vashni Bashi points out that there are patterns of systemic anti-Black racism internationally um, that are really influential here, uh, that immigration policies themselves, spoiler alert, often discriminate by race um, and typically the confoundment of race and ethnicity. Um, there's a belief that black people are unsuitable for some work, either culturally or biologically because it's too cold and they weren't made for that. Um, there's the reliance on black people to simply fulfill labor demands on contract bases only with expectations that immediately upon finishing that work that they will return home. Um, this has been a historical phenomenon and it hasn't really changed now. Um, we saw this following World War II with soldiers um, who fought, you know, for, for you know, the allies um, during, during the war and were expected to immediately go home. Um, Britain did a lot to, uh, uh, to make sure that those soldiers felt unwelcome if they tried to, uh, to immigrate to uh, Britain, which many were actually doing because they realized it was better than being at home uh, in the US. And then there are fears of that, that linger among the public about black people becoming a permanent addition to one's nation. Um, and then other forms range from being microaggressions to uh, like outright acts of violence with fatal consequences. Um, so a couple of international examples of global uh, anti-blackness, we have Brazil, which uh, is just famous for its, its denial of racism, type of racism, um, very much a covert form of colorblind racism. Um, Brazil was famously one of the last nations to abolish slavery. It had one of the largest populations, if not the largest population of slaves from Africa actually during the transatlantic slave um, uh, industry. Um, and they operate very much on this myth of having a racial democracy. Um, my best friend is from Brazil and when I talked about, you know, the, the prospect of coming to visit her and what that would mean and what that would look like, um, it was always really interesting to, to, to discuss it um, because I was like, you know, what, what's life like for Black people in Brazil? And she was like, well, you don't really consider yourself to be like Brazilian or Black Brazilian. You're just Brazilian, right? Um, and it's, it's kind of different from the U.S. Where, where I'm from, where you're Black American or African American. Um, and so I was like, oh, so race isn't a thing. She's like, yeah, but it is. <laughs> um, so for example, uh, in, in Brazil, race is really tied to class. And so uh, there's kind of like, there's these black people and those black people. And there are some instances where those black people who would be those who are poor, who had lower life chances and things like that, they would be expected to walk through a different door. 
But I wouldn't have to worry because, because I'm these black people, right? So I can go through whichever door I want, apparently. Um, so yeah, um, many people don't know that they're black, but it's not due to a lack of discrimination. It's because of that denial of racism. Um, you'll hear a lot of stories about people from Brazil finding out that they are different and that people view them differently much later in life. Um, and they're actually not very happy about it. Um, it's not like this like utopia type thing. Um, here's an example from South Asia, anti-black racism. Racism. Um, this is a couple. Um, uh, they are YouTubers and they have their own uh, YouTube channel and they've been on the BBC and everything. Um, hashtag India meets Ghana. And he's from India, she's from Ghana. And they talk about some of the things that they've had to deal with on a more micro level. Um, microaggressions, but also downright like discrimination, threats and things like that because especially for him, because he was marrying a black woman and him being told time and time again, we don't marry black women. Um, I'm gonna pick up my favorite people. I lived in Japan for a, 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 about three years um, and Japan is famously known for its racism. Um, I mean, against everyone who's an outsider basically. Um, and a uh, serious problem there. Um, Japan has been known as being xenophobic uh, for a very long time, um, so, so yeah. Um, but here's one example um, where uh, comedians actually um, uh, said that uh, Naomi Osaka needed bleach, um, actually, uh, you know, because she was too tan, um, as if though there wasn't this other guy here that needs bleach more, but whatever, we'll, we'll just move on. Um, and then we have black, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Yeah, so then we have the NHK's um, recent racist BLM cartoon. And if you haven't seen it, go look at it. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, this was, a, NHK is like a national public channel in Japan. Like it's like, it's, it's like a main channel everybody has and everybody watches. So it's their national news and, and everything else. And so they create it in order to explain BLM to Japanese people anime that was very much a caricature um, of blackness and disgusting. Don't watch it now, okay, but go watch it later. Look up NHK BLM, it's so offensive. And they don't even mention police brutality, violence, any of that. They're just saying basically black people are angry because we don't make enough money. It is so, so ridiculous. Um, and then one thing in Japan that they've always done is blackface. Oh, so much blackface and they're still doing it. Um, comedians do blackface. There's a New Year's show every year where there's blackface occurring. Um, there are music groups that in order to honor black music, they will wear blackface. There's also another part of Japanese culture um, that actually includes blackface as well, to some extent where women are getting deeply tanned and wearing their hair and or trying to wear their hair in, in styles that um, are like that are reflected of black culture. And then don't think that the Arab world is gonna get left out of this. Of course not, but we have some more examples. Blackface seems to be one of the things that comes up very often. Um, here we have an influencer who was um, uh, trying to show her solidarity. There's a couple of those actually. Here's one, I think I spelled Libya wrong, ignore that. Um, here's one from Algeria in blackface. Uh, here is in Lebanon, a musician, blackface. Oh my gosh, usually it's in honor, but not anymore. And now it's making fun of black people. Um, this is from uh, an Egyptian comedian um, who is portraying herself as a Sudanese woman um, who is boorish. Here's another one from Libya, which I, yes, I did spell wrong the first time. <laughs> um, I, and it's not from Morocco. I'm sorry, I confused this with another image. My bad, um, but yeah. Blackface all over the place. Um, there are um, claims from Tunisia that um, black minorities aren't given the same opportunities as other citizens despite having citizenship. Um, there's the use of the term a bid being used as a pejorative against black people. Um, and then there's an overall disdain for interracial marriages as well. So nobody is free of this. Um, I didn't get into it here. Um, but even in Africa, <laughs> we can find that there, I mean, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we can still find um, anti-Black uh, sentiment. And in the United States, among the Black community in the U.S., we still find anti-Black sentiment. If you ask people in the U.S. who do they least want to live near, 
everyone, including black people says black people. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's huge. It's globalized, it's internalized and it's everywhere. So I speak of bodies here. And part of the reason why I speak of bodies, the oppression of black and brown bodies is because one, I've been listening to this book called The Body is Not an Apology by an activist and poet named Sonia Renee Taylor. And she points out that we all have bodies. They're all functioning differently. Maybe they may look different, but everyone has a body and it's as simple as that. And so it's just trying to get to that most foundational element of connecting humans to one another, right? Because the idea of viewing people as people and human apparently doesn't work well for us in being able to relate to one another. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates also uses this bodily paradigm, reminding his son that our bodies are made of these airways, muscle, bone, and teeth that are threatened um, and treated oppressively and with violence. Um, and so all of the issues that we talk, to, talk about as social scientists um, and other scientists as well, um, all of these issues are all talking about things that are affecting our bodies. Uh, racism, sexism, eth ethnocentrism, all of the isms are all including our bodies and they're happening to our bodies. And so um, the bodies are a fundamental political and social unit we could all relate to. Um, so yeah, that's why we, I like using the term body. Um, globally, the oppression of black and brown bodies um, is hierarchical. And although, you know, everyone, almost everyone on earth can say that they are, you know, or at least the majority of people on earth can say that they are being oppressed because of their body in some way, shape or form. There's no need to enter an oppression Olympics, right? Um, I think that this is what happens when we talk about Black Lives Mattering. People say, what, what about all lives? And I'm like, it's not, it's not a competition, right? We don't need to be in the Olympics for this. Um, but it's been made obvious and without a doubt that there are those who are committed to the humiliation, the terror, and the destruction of Black bodies in particular. Um, a theorist, uh, Andrea Smith, says that there are three pillars um, of white supremacy on which the oppression of black and brown bodies are built. Um, slavery and capitalism, which we talked about a bit with neoliberalism and the co commodification of these bodies for profit. Genocide and colonialism uh, and the disappearance of bodies, their desired absence, people wanting to push these bodies out of view um, because they're so crude or seen as being crude. Um, or Orientalism and war, the view of these bodies as per perpetual threats. Um, and we can see this really clearly uh, in the forms of violence and oppression that we see against black and brown bodies. Um, the violence and fear and phobia of black and brown bodies. Um, I, I've been reading a book called um, Fearing the Black Body. I actually have it next to me. Yay. Shout out. Oh, you, you can't see it. Sorry. Anyway, shout out to the AUS library. It's called Fearing the Black Body, the Racist Origins of Fat Phobia. And it actually talks about how a lot of our societal fat, uh, fear of fatness can be linked back to racism as well. Um, and depictions of the sassy fat black friend, the person who's undesirable, unattractive, but fun, right? Um, that's something we see, we see that trope all the time in TV and in movies as well, right? And so it's kind of like, oh, you're fun, but I don't wanna be you, right? Um, we see that violence in the hypersexuality and fetishism of black and brown bodies. We see this in medical treatment of black and brown bodies um, with Serena Williams is one of the most vocal and, and visible people who talks about what it's like to be a black woman um, giving birth or, or there are so many other uh, pieces of literature that you can look up, ask me about it, right? We have the top, hot and tot Venus, right? Um, showing black women being treated um, or being treated without anesthesia or, or you know, basically just being operated on uh, with no medications and things like that. Um, we can see the violence in anti-immigration um, and we can see the vi violence that's being used to reinforce the racist hierarchy. Um, and that's kind of where I'm wrapping this up. Um, in particular, looking at police brutality and violence. And I think it's important to, in, un, to recognize the interconnectedness of this form of violence in particular, the, the police brutality and how international it is not only in its occurrence, but also in its creation as well. And so here you're looking at a slide that's depicting black solidarity between Palestine and black Americans. And this is actually, I think a really important note 
um, to end on, especially here in, in this environment in the Arab world, um, that the violence between black and brown bodies um, that we see in the United States is not limited within that sphere, right? Um, that it is created and that it also affects people beyond the US, right? And it affects people beyond the actual black bodies of like, you know, uh, of, of Afro descent. Um, we see with the increasing militarization of police in the US, a link to the war on terror, right? From the US as well, um, with the weapons that were purchased and that have been sent. Um, the, the war zone kind of mentality that we're seeing coming back from the war on terror into the US with police departments being given weapons and guns and, and tactics and gear and increased escalation of situations to the point where police start to view themselves at war. And this is not just a coincidence. We know that police are being trained in Israel, right? Um, and we know that there's a growth of a Zionist movement in the US. And then we start to see as well, although the, the, the um, interconnectedness of uh, black power movements and of uh, Palestinian movements have existed for decades on top of decades, right? We had the Black Panther movement um, or Black Panther Party, sorry. Um, we had SNCC as well. Um, it's, it's still happening now. We're seeing that there are youth um, groups that are move, that are coming to Palestine, not now because of COVID, I don't think there's, there have been any recently, but that they are coming to either Palestine or to Lebanon uh, to meet because there's such a connection between um, Black Americans and between Palestinian efforts as well, right? Um, I think one was called the Dream Defenders. There was this... Uh, in 2014, there was a piece in the New York Times. It was based on this photo uh, with the caption, you, you gonna shoot us? Is this the Gaza Strip, right? Um, and so I just feel like there's something there. That's where I wanna end there. There's something there where we need to really um, start to you know, view bodies um, with a really connected uh, sense and to see that these kinds of movements um, are really one and the same very often. All right, and that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us and giving us a talk about such an important topic. Mm -hmm.